thing they brought <laughs> 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 But I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what ones are the same as the new ones? They're just, I just think we could be here. Okay. There is class. And and it's kind of so what it used to be was originally the minor stock all one book. It's right here. Um, I mean, it's right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah. 
Well, so he asked me most of Ramon and I were connected. And so I'm afraid to do it. the man, the plan. Well, I want to invite you all to get your Bibles out. Let's go over to the book of Nehemiah. We're in Nehemiah chapter 7. We got the wall built. We got a lot of things to settle out. You know, uh, just having the wall uh, really, you know, isn't it, it isn't everything. Nehemiah's got a lot of problems to settle. He's got a lot of things to investigate, some things to look into. So I'm pretty excited about that, the things we're going to be talking about tonight. As we kind of talk about these things, too, we're going to be talking about uh, some different people and, and some conversations about, you know, what the things that the, uh, that the Israelites, the, the people there held as important. So let's go ahead and get our Bibles out. We're going over to chapter 7. <laughs> Before we get started tonight, Ryan, can I call you? We should be just Sorry, Frank. Our Father, then we thank you for this opportunity we have on this Wednesday night to gather together to study from your word, especially from the book of Nehemiah. We pray as we approach uh, the example you've given us of Nehemiah, that we look into our own lives and glean the lessons to apply to our lives. We thank you so much for the Bible and the blessings we get people studying and applying to our lives. We pray for Biden, who might have good remembrance of the lessons prepared. We also pray for the members that are away today, whether they're sick or traveling. That they might be able to come back to us safely. Thank you so much for all you give. Just say we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Nehemiah chapter 7. Uh, and the first thing we want to talk about is that it was when the wall was built and I said, hung the doors. What are the doors? Gates. Yeah. Yeah. So he hung the gates. He's, he's got everything set up. What is, the, uh, what is the next thing that Nehemiah is going to do here? What's the next thing that he does? Remember, Nehemiah is our administrator. And, you know, he's our, can we say our godly administrator? What a strange thing. But he is the one who has the skill of organization. And this is part of that. So what's the next thing he does? You mean the list? Yeah, well, he, well he's going to make he's gonna make a couple of lists, by the way. He's going to go through, we're going to get to that genealogy. We're going to talk about that one for a little bit here. And then he's also going to do what? So. He's got to name men to, yeah. to, to lead. So he starts putting men in charge. Remember our big thing about Nehemiah? One of the great lessons of Nehemiah is, it starts with a D. Delegation. 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 
And we saw it with Moses. We saw it with Moses' father-in-law. I'll talk about it. But Nehemiah is good at this. So Nehemiah is going to delegate. I gave charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani, and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. So that brings up the question: Who are these people? Uh, by the way, uh, anybody catch that the question written? Kind of strange. Yeah. Uh, I, um, so I don't know if I want you to know I didn't write these questions. You think, well, you know, what do we do around here? Anyway? Uh, so I pulled these questions somewhere else, but it sounds like whoever writ, wrote this was thinking of one person. So at first I thought, maybe there's a variation of translation that, that just puts it as one person. There's no, it's just a mistake. So we're really talking about two people. So I broke the question. So first of all, who was Hannah? Who does he call him here? <coughs> My brother. Uh, most people take that not as a my brother and fellow Israelite, but my brother. Did we meet him before? Anybody look that one up? Can and I, have you seen him before? Yeah, way back in chapter 1, he was there. He was the one that brought the information to Nehemiah. So kind of interesting that he was back in, you know, the Persian, with the Persians, and then he came with Nehemiah. So most people say this is probably Nehemiah's actual brother. And he's the one in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, that brought the news that Jerusalem was in trouble. So, obviously, this is somebody that it matters to, that Jerusalem's problems matter to. So, it makes sense he put him in charge, that he would set him up. Um, next question was, this other person, who is Hananiah? Who is Hananiah? He's a craftsman. Um, you know, his, his, him and his children manage gold and build things, but I found that interesting that he seems to be like an engineer or something. You know the tough thing about the name Hananiah, Gregor? There's a lot of Hananiahs. And so the question is, is that the same guy or not? And maybe it is. So I, I sort of suspected it was because yeah. it was it was earlier in Hannah it was in Ezra that he talked about it. Right, right. Um, but I'm not, I, I can honestly say that I'm not sure. But, you know, I was looking up different Hananiahs, and you know, what the one surprised me, uh, Sandal, remember our guy Sandalot, the bad guy of this uh, of this book. Uh, his first name was Hananiah. So uh, just as a coincidence. So Gregor's uh, point it draws us back to this other person, Hananiah. Uh, what kind of guy was Hananiah? Say he's faithful. Yeah, he was a faithful man. He was a faithful man. Now. Remember that in politics, and surely this isn't the story today, a lot of times people are in politics to get rich, to take care of themselves, things like that. So what's Nehemiah's goal of picking these people? Yeah, he wants people that are going to be faithful to God, that Jerusalem is what they care about. So he's going to be picking people that have that characteristic. Uh, he was faithful. He feared God. I like the way the... New King James says this. He feared God more than many. What's that? I, I was just going to say, uh, it's interesting that 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 is Nehemiah's first uh, requirement for the people he's looking for. Because you might think that it would be a temptation as a governor, leader type person that he might just look for. Uh, you're a good manager or look at this, but it seems like the top thing he's looking for is. I like that. I like that idea because does that translate well to us? Uh, you know, to say, hey, if I want to put somebody in charge of something spiritually, I want somebody who fears God. You know, uh, you know, a lot of times rulers of the past have said, I want you to fear me. Nehemiah's smart enough to say, don't worry about me. Fear God. Fear God. Uh, what's the what's the fear of the Lord? What's the fear of the Lord? George, you told me the other day, you said the fear of the Lord. Oh, you didn't hear me. <laughs> you want to close the door? Go ahead. Uh, um, but what's the fear of the Lord, Tasha? Is it, is it wisdom? Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's right. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What else do you fear of the Lord? It is to hate evil. Evil. Evil in every false way. Yes. So I like I like this. And I, by the way, I think fear of the Lord is a great thing to venture out in. We won't do it tonight. But the fear of the Lord, I've told you before, my analogy is always electricity. You know, uh, I want electricity, but I don't want to mess with it. I'm going to call Gerald and say, Gerald, come help me. I need help on the electricity because I'm afraid to handle it. But I desperately want it. I want the Lord in my life, but I'm going to treat him like I treat electricity. I'm not going to just mishandle it or handle it anyway. 
And that's the kind of guy that he wants. He wants somebody, and think of this like this, we're building a building. We're building something really important. And you want somebody that says, hey, you know, you've got to build things carefully. That's the kind of person you want building with you. So this is all good stuff. Stephen? I have to wonder if we really appreciate the number of enemies that me and Maya have, not only outside the walls, but inside the walls. Yeah, yeah. The priests all seem to be against you. Let's say he's got, like, a lot of nations against him outside. But I think he's probably got, well, it's just a guess, but, you know, maybe half the people in town are against him, too. Certainly, he hasn't made friends with the nobles by making them do what? Remember last week they had to sign a promise that they were going to let all their their slaves free and forgive debts? Well, that's, uh, you know, that's probably not something they wanted to do. So he's probably made a lot of people upset there. You mentioned the priests who really haven't been doing what they should be doing. By the way, we think Malachi is written sometime close to now or maybe just a little bit after this. One of Malachi's great things uh, to write about is against the priests. And he accuses the priests of being... Uh, shoddy or uncaring about the things they're doing, offering God uh, for sacrifices. So we see a lot of those things coming up right now. So it's a great point to say he's got a lot of people that are against him that don't want to see him succeed. And that's a rough one for him. And uh, it's going to be something we can deal with a couple of times. Anybody else got something to throw at this? So Nehemiah, chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 3 says, well, you know, I said to them, don't let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while, while they stand and guard, let them shut uh, and bar the doors and appoint guards among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. What is that? Uh, don't open the gates till the sun is hot. What's that mean? What do you got, Gregor? Well, I mean, the sun gets hot. Around at least at this in this area, it's 33 degrees north latitude, so 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, and that's very late for a gate opening. Yeah. So traditionally, it almost been a sun sunrise and sunset maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really late, and that keeps the vagabonds away who like the night. Yeah. I, I got a trick question for you. Uh, when had they been opening the gates? What um, was? All right. There were no gates. So by the way, this is a new procedure. They're creating a new set of rules for something they had done, not just in their lifetime, but the lifetimes of their fathers, grandfathers, going back, you know, 150, 170 years to the time of its destruction. There haven't been a, how do we handle the gate system? Well, Nehemiah is putting in place guards for the gates. Now, I thought that this was interesting, uh, not just with the guards of the gates, but what else? What does he say? You're going to have a guard at the gate. Uh, what does he need to be? What kind of, what does he say? He says, this guy has to be, yeah, he has to be from Jerusalem. Uh, kind of makes sense, right? You know, don't bring in somebody you couldn't necessarily say is, you know, faithful. He doesn't want the city to be lost. Where's the second guard? At their house. What is that? What is that? What do you think? Their house has been completely rebuilt yet. Okay. So they were susceptible to. So why is it important to make sure the guards who are watching the gates aren't susceptible to the whip? Why is it we want to make sure those guards uh, have their focus? Because if we have enemies out there and the enemies want to get in Jerusalem, what's the oldest way in the book to break to get into the city of your enemy? Ah, and he's got it right there. Bribe or threat. And so Nehemiah is thinking one step ahead to say, what if we're putting this, getting this taken care of ahead of time. So Nehemiah is setting up a system that's going to take care of the city. It's going to take care of the gates, and he's uh, he's ensuring that these things are going to be done properly. Now, city's large, it says in verse 4, but what's the, there's not a lot of people. That's kind of interesting. Big city, not many people. What's going on with that? What are the condition of the houses? Dilapidated. Yeah. They've been yeah. working on the wall. You know, I was listening to, some, uh, to a history podcast, uh, and they were talking about a, a town that after it's abandoned, they said the first thing that happens is all the roofs collapse, you know, that these old beams and such, the roofs will come in, and, and then slowly the walls will come in. So you've got a lot of shells of houses. You know, one of my favorite places is Port Stevens. And you ever drive out to Port Stevens, you look at the houses there, what do you see? You don't see anything. Uh, and those houses are newer 
than the houses in Jerusalem would have been to the people there. So, you know, you kind of can get the sense if you drive out on that parade ground and it's just nothing but foundations, uh, probably a lot of Jerusalem look like that. So it's worth considering that this is a pretty, you know, a pretty profound state that the city pretty empty. So we need people. What kind of people do we want? What kind of people are we going to be bringing in? What's he, what's he next going to? Genealogy. He pulls out the genealogy. Um, why is genealogy? Um, I tell you what, I, uh, I'm going to pass over the comparison. Uh, it's fascinating to look at the fact that what Nehemiah is doing is he is looking at a list that was originally back at the list that was put together back in Ezra whenever they first came out many decades before. But, but he pulls this out. What is the purpose of the genealogy? What, uh, why does that matter? Talk to me. Is it uh, owning land? Okay, so there's a big part of this is owning land because, um, you know, when I grew up in New Mexico, we had something, we had land grants uh, that the Spanish king had given out. And one of the bigger land grants is something called the Ejido Land Grant which was a big land grant to a whole group of people. Uh, typically, they were the natives that lived there. They would they called the native uh, groups Pueblos, and they would be given a grant. And if you wanted to, today in New Mexico, if you wanted to live on that, you had to prove that you were related to these people. So right away, genealogy is important. What else is important about that? Greg? Well, the Abrahamic being the... Israel was founded on the fact that they're all children of Israel. Yes. So that turns into, I mean, they've been, they've been in exile for 70 years. They've been conquered several times in this route. And so there's later in the chapter, we'll get into some really important reasons why they yeah. have to do that. So, so I want to, I want to say this, that genealogy to an Israelite is a legal way of identification. Is a legal way of identification. Talk about this in Luke in our Sunday morning class. But the reason Luke and Matthew sit down and say, hey, we have to go over a genealogy of Jesus, is that is a legal identification to somebody. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. Um, it also should remind them of, the, of, of what God actually did. He brought 2,000 people back from captivity just to build the wall and resources. Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting is, you know, this this idea of, you know, how many people were brought back, how many people were then, uh, you know, the Bible and genealogies are interesting because one of the more interesting genealogies, I think, is when the Israelites go into the wilderness and when they come out of the wilderness and the numbers there, which indicate that a great majority of them, you know, are gone, died, like God said. Numbers are interesting. Tasha, you were going to answer. Oh, yeah. It also... The priesthood? Who's in the priesthood? Oh, that's important because, in fact, we saw that here uh, as, as if you read through here when it talked at the beginning of verse 39 on. What was it, Tacho? You said it well. You said that the priests, what? Some uh, of the priests. Who really was? Yeah, who said. really was a priest because it mattered. One of the important ideas is that the identity of the nation of Israel was genealog genealogically based. Now, why do you need to know that from the new, for the New Testament? I already mentioned Jesus, but what maybe, and this is actually in the New Testament, it's actually after the New Testament period. What happened after the New Testament period, Anthony? So that's when the Romans went and destroyed Jerusalem. Yes. Yes. So all the genealogies to let people know who, what tribe they were under. And so after that. So you know, at least three times the Romans destroyed those genealogy records. Herod destroyed a bunch. In 8070, a bunch were destroyed, and in 8132, all the marriage records were destroyed. So that effectively, after that time, Israel, in a legal sense, ceases to exist. Because of that genealogical uh, deprivation, there's no legal basis that somebody could say, yeah, I'm a descendant of, it's done. Now, that's, that's a pretty major thing to have happened. And by the way, why is it so important that we're, we see that happening? What's the significance? End of the Old Covenant. End of the Old Covenant. Worship, yeah. When God put it into the Old Covenant, he really put it into the Old Covenant. When God ended those things, he really ended those things. And to this day, if they want to restart it, there's no legal means by which it can be done. And there hasn't been for nearly 2,000 years. It's a pretty dramatic thing. I think I saw a couple of hands. Anybody want to throw a comment to that? Stephen? I had a question. Yeah. 
So, do you think it's strange, or is there some timing that I'm missing between Ezra 264 and I'm not trying to pin you down on this page. <laughs> There's 42,360 matching on both versus Nehemiah 764. Yeah, 766 and Ezra 264. Exactly the same number. I'm just wondering about that. Okay, so I think that what we're probably doing is looking at the same list that he's reviewing. That's the records he's looking at. Um, I'm really nervous about these numbers uh, because um, I, I don't understand exactly sometimes, you know, I've, I've said this before. There's a lot of times in the Bible, they count things different than we count things. And so whether it's the three days and three nights in the, in the earth with Jesus or, you know, uh, lots of different things. Now, by the way, I'm, I, I say that to say, not to say something like, you know, the days of creation are days. That's absolutely not. That, that's, that's an easy one. But there are times where we're, we're looking at somebody's record of reigning and, and they use, they count things in a way that I, I struggle to understand because they may have just counted things a little differently. Uh, I saw another hand up. Somebody's going to help me out here. Uh, and it was greater. I'm not going to help you out. I'm going to throw some oil on the fire. No, oh, well, that's true. Um, yeah, because being a math geek, I had to compare between Ezra and Nehemiah. And a vast majority of the numbers match perfectly. But there are a few where there's one, it's not by a single number, but like one family was in Ezra was 2,630, and in Nehemiah there's 2,930. Or one is 266 and one is 265. I mean, you know, there's just really small differences. And I can't tell you what those differences are. I just found it fascinating because... And yet the addition at the end is the same. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, like I said, I don't have an answer on that. Uh, if we're playing the games, dump the chum. You know, there's yeah, a bit here. Because uh, I don't know. I don't know why there might be variations. I can think of a couple of reasons. One thing might be, well, who's, you know, whose tribe is this person really under? Or... You know, is it possible that these numbers were after the census? You know, it's it's like counting pilgrims on the ship when they leave England and when they arrive in you know New England. Well, the numbers are different. You know, things have happened, so you know that that might be part of that too. I'm not always sure, and as I said, I'm not always sure about the way they count things either. It's something that's tough on too. So, uh, so it's a good point. You're gonna say. Uh, you know, we're getting back a little bit. I was thinking about uh, in verse four when he talks about the fact that no houses have been rebuilt. Uh, you know, when we were in Ezra, we read about um, them talking about before they rebuilt the temple that they had been building all the houses. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what it's, it sounds like me that it's implying that because they took so long to build the wall, all their fancy houses and panel homes they could build might have been sacked or created by people around them. Very interesting. Very interesting. I hadn't thought about that in part because, you know, they, uh, uh, so Grant's uh, point is that, you know, it's taken them decades to get here, that they haven't had walls for, for a long time. And we've said already that without walls, the city's not safe. So perhaps all those homes that they built have, uh, you know, have, you know, been, been ransacked or circumstances like that. It's an interesting observation, and uh, it could be the case because we do have a you build your houses first by uh, by pay guy, and you know that that conversation. So there is some building the houses. I also think though it could be that there's just a lot of empty houses. You know, you had a city of half a million people and fifty thousand came back. You have a lot of empty houses too. So I'm not sure. That's a good good comment though. Um, why does Nehemiah do this? Why does Nehemiah sit down? What? What connection does that have? Look at verse 4. He said, the city's big, not a lot of houses. Verse 5, God put it in my heart to gather the nobles and register it by genealogy. What's, what's the connection here? What, why, why is this the conversation? What do you think? Why is it you're thinking, got a lot of empty homes here. I mean, but, but I'm going to add my little thought. We need to fill them up. So who do we need to fill them up with? Well, it's best Samaritans, it's Mammonites. Yeah, you know? want to fill them up with the, the children of Abraham. Yeah! So, what do you got to do? Who are the children of Abraham? So, it might be the case that what we're saying is a big empty city. You know, we now have a wall, so what are people going to want to do? They don't want to live here. <laughs> but we don't want, you know, all these other nations here because why, why not? That, that seems kind of. You know, unfair. You don't want the other nations. What's special about Jerusalem? 
God's people. They're God's people. Jerusalem is the place where the Bible, and he said it several times, God has put his name here. And God has given a name to Israel. So this place is supposed to be something special for Israel. Now, what's fascinating about that is we can talk a little more and say, yet God took away the land of Israel. But in a sense, Jerusalem remained. And that's still theirs. And so it's important that it remain theirs. And I find it fascinating that Nehemiah's thinking ahead, thinking, you know, for the next 30, 40, 50 years, people are going to say, hey, let's move into Jerusalem. they got a wall now. We want to make sure that they are those that are identified. Because what, what can happen to genealogical records? Destroyed, misplaced, or baked, altered, yeah. So it's fascinating that he says, we're going to register people now. You know, of course, he's got the original list. Um, part of the implication is we're going to be taking that original list and uh, putting it up against the people that, uh, uh, that you know, we're, we're trying to consider what they're on and who they are and who, they, who they're descended from, because otherwise we might have some questions. Now, by the way, uh, were there any, any Israelites living there before these people came back? And, yeah, there were. We might remember in Jeremiah we saw a bunch of them. We know that the, you know, the Babylonians left a few. So, yeah, there were a few, but not too many. So it's important to understand that uh, there might have been some people not on these lists because they weren't, you know, taken away into captivity. But in large part, we need to know the descendants of these people because it matters very much. So anybody have any more comments? Skipping up to chapter 8 now. Anybody have any more comments in chapter 7? Greg? Well, I just, and, you know, and it's really important in, in 62-ish, um, of the or 63 of the priests, the sons of Abiah, the sons of Hakal, and the sons of Abila, who took wives and daughters of Bergilai, the Gileadite, was named to them, and these searched among the ancestral records but could not be located. So these guys thought they were priests, they thought they were supposed to be doing their job, and they couldn't because they couldn't become their records. And I love also, though, the way they deal with them, they said, Stop practicing until you can be brought before the high priest yeah. and have God determine it. Why do you like that? Well, because they're not saying that they're bad people or wrong. Yeah. They're just saying, we don't have the information, so God will determine whether or not you can serve. My grandmother, uh, grandfather always said, Brian, we are descended from a long line of Cherokee chiefs. <laughs> we, got, uh, we got that DNA testing. We are not descended from a long line. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, my grandfather believed it. His father believed it. It was a story. And I can't wonder if some people came back and said, yeah, you're descended from, you know, the, the high priests. And, you know, oh, that's great. And you get back and you don't know if that's true or not. You know, you don't have that ability to prove that. So the whole thing is that, you know, genealogies can be kind of messy. And I, I agree with Breaker. It's kind of neat that their solution was, we'll let God answer this. We'll let God Figure this out. Anybody else comments in chapter 7? Let's go to chapter 8. Chapter 8 picks up and it begins, all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. Not the one from Washington, D.C. Oh, it wasn't that It wasn't that <laughs> And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So, Israel, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Um, first question, what prompts this? What prompts this? Well, it's probably have some solidarity here, and where is going to be that solidarity in God's word? And if we're going to be connected that way, and you preach on this last week about fellowship, yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. You know, and, and, and their big deal is fellowship is, de is, is defined by this law and that relationship. And so that's exactly right. Right? Well, and that's what, and, and before that, you know, we're going to and other books, or the Esther and other books around the time. We don't see the Jews practicing anything. And, you know, so all of this knowledge is apparently lost. Um, some of it is fascinating that it was saved throughout history, that they still have to read even, you know, given what they've been through. was actually an incredible feat. And, you know, you got to wonder about divine providence here, because yeah. they have the books to read. Yeah, yeah. There's something really interesting about that, because 
They certainly haven't loved those books. Mm -hmm. uh, we even saw one king try to destroy the book of Nehemiah or Jeremiah, and it was it was restored. Uh, they don't care for them at all, and yet they have survived. That is remarkable, friend. Well, it seems like maybe they're doing this now the first chance that Nehemiah has. Oh. If we're still following after chapter 7, right after they built the walls, uh, and they were pretty busy with it. So it seems like he's taking the opportunity now to kind of be, you know, appointing leader, and he's sorting out the genealogies, and now he's going to sort out the wall. Yeah, that's a, that's a neat point, that this only makes sense. Good. Any other thoughts? Uh, Tacho? Yeah, so all this time, there is there a temple there? No. Yeah, so they did build the temple, uh, what do we say, 60 years before this? So they have had a temple for a while. So good question, good question. In fact, what's interesting is when they built the temple, anybody notice that it was the same time that was mentioned? Here's a question. What about the time? Did you notice it's mentioned twice, right at the end of the last chapter? And then right at verse what, verse 2, uh, I'm sorry, verse, uh, yeah, verse 2 there, uh, he mentions it twice. Anybody catch that? When was it? Seventh month. Now, by the way, seventh month. Um, anybody, anybody smart enough to say, I know exactly what time of year that is? I think it might have been around September. But, Stephen, you got it. Oh, right. Stephen and I agree, so Stephen's smart enough to do it. So that's <laughs> I think that might have been about right. Uh, I'm thinking that. Anybody know why the seventh month is special? Tom? Tom looked like he knew. He had that. Uh huh. <laughs> What's that? Yom Kippur. Well, what is Yom Kippur? Uh, yeah, atonement. Yes. The seventh month is a special month. It starts off with trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. It moves to something called the Day of Atonement. By the way, what happens on the Day of Atonement? That's when the state goes. Yes, the sins are taken away. By whom? Oh, by God. Well, Sacrifice. Yeah, so the Hebrew, you know, the book of Hebrews gives us, you know, I like the book of Hebrews because the book of Leviticus is kind of like, I, I'm not sure what just happened, but the book of Hebrews just says, hey, once a year, what did the high priest do? Went in the holy place, and he made he made sacrifice, uh, you remember what the Hebrew writer said, first for himself, and then for all of Israel. So this is that. This is what's going on here. You started off with trumpets, you went to atonement, one piece right after that was what? Yeah, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, that was one of the three times you're supposed to go to the city of Jerusalem. So, have these really been great about this one, by the way? Um, Anthony? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> our, our presumption is the Israelites have been horrible about keeping feast days. Uh, they're like the guy that says, yeah, I'm a Christian. How do we go to church Easter and Christmas? You know, uh, That's kind of what it's like. They've been about that bad. They don't do these feasts unless a king says, hey, everybody, we're doing the feast. You know, Hezekiah, Josiah, you know, guys like that. But they just didn't engage it. By the way, I want you to think in that terms because that's the corresponding thing to our worship today. Not, not the Sabbath. That's not... That's not the corresponding moment of worship. They didn't, they didn't worship on the Sabbath. What did they do on the Sabbath? Rest. Rested. Very good. Um, but the days, the feast days, were their worship. And that's what corresponds to what we do on the first day of the week. That's important. And, and we, we know that they did. And that's the reason why they had seven years in captivity. That's right. We talked about that one before. That, that, that they owe God for, uh, in that case, it was the, the battle here, the, the Sabbath years. That they had they had not done, and we, we our point is we don't think they've done any of it, any of it. Some of it's George. In the text on down in the chapter it says they hadn't done it since Joshua. Yeah. Well, so what do you think about that? So that's a very controversial statement. <laughs> um, and the answer is, well, if that's what it says. But I will say this: they'll say things like, uh, I know, like Josiah in his time they'll say they celebrated it, and there hadn't been a feast like this ever before. But then we saw Hezekiah's time they did it too. So we always kind of struggle to put together what, what they mean with something like that. So is it the case that nobody ever celebrated the Feast of Booths? Or is it the case that they didn't put these feasts together like that? Uh, it's hard for me to say for sure. But that's incredible to think. Because by the way, if they haven't celebrated it since the time of Joshua, what did Joshua do? 
Look back in our minds and our minds. Joshua did what for Israel? Easy answer. He brought them to the land. And the Feast of Booths was meant to commemorate living in the wilderness. But wait a second. If they haven't celebrated the memorial of living in the wilderness since they came out of the wilderness, what does that mean? Now, it's also possible Joshua, some people say it could be the high priest Joshua, um, too, since it's mentioned back in Ezra. But if it's, I don't know, I don't think. It's son of son of none. That's right, that's right. So I don't, I don't think it is. I think it has to be this guy. And so the point is, if they haven't celebrated it since Joshua, they've actually never celebrated. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I was thinking about this last week too, since we kind of brought it up in. But I was wondering if it could also mean because here it specifically talks about them making the booths and living in them. If it's saying they hadn't observed it correctly, if they hadn't actually done the putting out the tent and living in it for the day, and maybe they had done it before and it had just been at peace. Now that's interesting, and, and like I said again, that that. Kind of helps us to think that maybe that would explain what we're saying here, that they weren't doing it correctly, and so it hadn't been celebrated in that sense since the time of Joshua. That, that's actually a, a very good observation, Stephen. So uh, then getting to what you said, because now you agree, they actually did uh, celebrate the Feast of Booths. They did not. They did. I mean, oh, they did. I'm sorry. Four, yeah. Um, it was three. So, so again, that, that kind of goes back to the idea of potentially being Joshua the priest, but son of Nun kind of kind of nixes that too. So it's hard to reconcile. It. But like I said, I, I'm not sure exactly what that means, except you know, Grant's got an next answer uh, that maybe it is the idea that didn't celebrate properly. Who else has got a good answer? Anybody else want to throw their go? Grant's got a second good answer. It could be an exaggeration of this saying. I guess it could be, you know, I guess it could be, because like I said, going back to Joshua was basically saying you never did it. So, you know, it might, it might be something, uh, you know, hyperbole uh, in that sense too. Uh, that's a good, that's a good point too, Jordan. I remember under Hezekiah, they hadn't participated in the Passover. Right. Who knows how long. Well, you know, and, and what's interesting with Hezekiah's observation of the Passover, some say, with, maybe it's actually in Kings or Chronicles where it says, since David, is that right? Um, I want to say David is the mark. I'm just, I don't remember George. So I don't want to be stumped twice in one class. So I won't say it, but, I, but I'm thinking it might have gone over back to David. So, so in other words, like I said, that that uncle that only goes to church on Christmas and Easter, he doesn't even go to the you know. That's, that's the Israelites in their way of worship. They have just been off. And, and, and what's funny is, what is God doing? Yes. And so we just don't really appreciate the patience and the grace of God mm -hmm. in the circumstance that they were this bad about it. Now, by the way, that's going to change here. Ezra seems to be the guy that kind of puts things back in order. And I, I need to talk more about what we're talking about, what we're about to come up to tonight. So I'm going to jump ahead for just a couple of moments to say that what Ezra is setting up is something that we're probably pretty familiar with in the New Testament. So let's do, let's, Go to this next point and say this. So Ezra is reading the law, everybody's listening, but what else is going on? Who else is reading? Who else is uh uh there with him? Verse four, verse five. Got other priests. Okay. Yeah, got other priests. And what else does he have to do? What is the second part of this question? What's what's he make sure everybody understands? Yeah, so he's reading from the book and he's he has priests going around giving the sense. Of the meaning. Now, a lot of people, smarter than me, what they see here is the beginning of something that we're very familiar with in the New Testament. Anybody want to guess what it is? Sanhedrin. Well, not Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin means the Council of Elders. So, uh, but that might be starting up here too, but it also starts with an S. Synagogue. <laughs> in the time of Jesus, the system of synagogue was the idea that you read the scriptures. We talked about this before in, in Luke 4. You read the scriptures from this place called the chair of Moses, and then you sat down and you talked about it, which is to say you got a sense of things. And what it might be is that what Ezra is starting here, you have a great sense of, of history because this is the end of inspired history for us. You know, Nehemiah is the last inspired history book we have. We have 450 years, and we have some other histories in the meantime, but they don't really help too well. 
We're pretty sure that that synagogue system is in place or, or it's a pretty uh, sophisticated system after a while. And it might be this is the very birth of where they're setting up a system where people are reading the scriptures, trying to get a sense of the understanding. So we have a sense then, uh, a creation of an idea that might be what, in the time of Jesus, is why those feasts were going on. They were going on. See that? It's kind of speculative, and I'm not sure if it's correct, but I kind of get the impression that he's standing in the podium, elevated above the people, and it's represents preaching. You know, that's what I think of, because, uh, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting is it describes preaching. Now, um, I'll be fair to say the podium is a more modern uh, you know, invention than anything else, but you know it does. It do, doesn't don't you picture preaching? You know, isn't that kind of what you pictured when you read it? You know, um, in that sense. Um, you know, I I didn't look this up. Maybe somebody else did. I wonder how long it would take to read through the law. What are the books of the law in the Bible? Like which are? Yeah, you you did work. No, I'm gonna say here uh, here it says on the first day you read forty till midday. Yeah, so, what, six hours, you think? Yeah. Um, now, by the way, um, I don't know if say that's the only thing we kind of take for granted, but, you know, ancient languages, you can't just sit down and read them. Um, even Latin, you actually have to sit there and kind of uh, put, it, put it together. So this is actually a pretty impressive thing that he does. Maybe even miraculous, that somebody could actually pull up texts and read through them like that. Um, that public reading, uh, you might recall that there's some conversation even in the New Testament about, you know, devoted to public reading, needed people to publicly read. Uh, that wasn't something that just, even if somebody could read, that they could do. Because when you publicly read, uh, you didn't have things like, you know, grammar marks or, you know, the, you know, apostrophes. Uh, in fact, in the New Testament, in Greek, you didn't even have spaces between words. You just put them all together. And so you can see why public reading was actually a pretty sophisticated thing. This is actually pretty impressive for somebody to, for a group of men to be able to do this. I, I really remark it. So, uh, important point. Anybody else have thought, Tom? Well, that was just remarkable. And Stephen was talking about being up on a pedestal above everybody else. And he, and he was showing, or at least uh, exposing, that he's reading this from the Word of God. Yeah. And, and I just think it kind of gives me goosebumps when he's, all the people rose up. Yeah, and it was the, the the same thing happened when Solomon was bringing the uh, into the temple. All the people rose. Yeah, and and so it was. It's like if this is the beginning of. Here's the direction. Here's the head. Here's the information. This is not man made. This is God's word, and we're going to start from this particular point and go forward. Were, was everybody reading along, Tom, in their own Old Testaments as they went on? No, they wouldn't have anything. So what might that indicate about this opportunity for some of these people? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, you could say this is the first time they've heard these things. Um, so why might people be standing up? Reverence to the word. You know, I'm going to say reverence to the word. Good. Uh, what else? You know, when I stand up sometimes, it's because I can't hear. I was I wondered if that might have been it too. Which all the people stand up. We're, hey, we're going to try this Sunday, okay? For services, we're going to stand up. But uh, I just want to impress upon you that that would really be dedication to stand and listen to someone talk for six hours. Um, and of course, they're really happy to hear all this, right? What's the reaction? Now, by the way, I, uh, I say that maybe their reaction is joy, but what's their physical reaction? So they start crying. Um, you know, it's interesting, the book of Ezra starts off with crying. Uh, and here we are crying again. The first time they're crying, why are they crying? When they built the temple, some people remember what it's like. Now they're crying again. But you know what's interesting? It doesn't actually say why they did it. So why why do you think they were crying? You know, I think there's a couple of things to think about here. What do you got? What do you think? Huh? I think they hurt their heart. Okay. They were, this is God's word. We're hearing this, like you said, this would be a unique thing that's happening. Maybe the first time they heard anything, it would be pretty inspiring. Uh, if you come all that way back, you spend all this effort and time to build up this to, this wall, and, and uh, now you're hearing some results, or yeah. at least why am I doing this? Well, here comes information that would hurt my heart. So sometimes when you're speaking, I, I get teary. Yes, you're <laughs> different reasons. But. <laughs> uh, so so let's start off with saying. 
Here's the positive. The positive is, you know, when David read God's law, he would say things like, God's law is so great to listen to. God's law is so incredible. And I tell you what, God's law, you read through Exodus, you read through Genesis, and wow, you read Exodus, you read the law, and you're like, wow, this is really impressive. So on one hand, it could be that here are people saying, this is fantastic. This is what, I've always wondered why we did that. I've never understood that, and I'm hearing it for the first time, Becky, and then Andy. I think they were possibly weeping because of what they were not doing. Oh, right. I bet that's what the rest of you had your hand up for, say, too. <laughs> yes. Who, who else did that in the Bible? Who else one day found the wall for the first time and, and was really upset? Famous king, one of Brian's favorites, Josiah. Josiah. When he found the wall and he read it, the Bible said he started pulling out his beard, he's on sackcloth, he's devastated. He hasn't been doing it. So, so two ideas I see here is that they might have been, this is great. And they might have been, this is awful. I can see both ways. Um, maybe maybe I don't have to pick one. I don't know. Hey, hey, we're going to add something. That was where Anthony yeah. was going. Grant, were you? Yeah, that was where you were going. So, uh, Becky stole your thunder. So, uh, uh, <laughs> but I, say that I like the way it said that in verse 12 that they were rejoicing because they had understood the words. And yeah. I bet for a lot of for most people who weren't priests, this might be the first time any great number of Israelites actually understood the law. So what if this is the first time in over a thousand years that they've understood the law? So that's something incredible to think about. We're out of time, so we've got to stop here. So we'll pick up uh, uh, next week. Actually, uh, Gregor's going to pick up for us next week because I mean, the preacher's running away on a week vacation. So. <laughs> So, Greg is going to take care of us next Sunday, or next Wednesday. So, thanks so much, Greg, for pausing on this. get a song book out uh, oh, by the way we put the red song books out uh, we don't take the red song books with us so if you want to just leave them in the chair tonight that's just fine we can use them uh, while we're here but we'll get your red song books out uh, if you would mark your song books our song of invitation is going to be song number 363 song number 363 that'll be our song of invitation tonight Saw Katrina, and I thought she was a high school kid. <laughs> so you have just a, another minute or two. Yeah. <clears throat> they're apparently having a good class. They're having a very good class. Yeah, they're uh, they're definitely uh, digging in. And they're in the book of Hebrews, and so that's a tough one. I'll tell you what, I am impressed that they dig into it like they're digging into something. We'll give it just a couple of minutes. I don't want to Back on the ground. I just got it. You just got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was. I jumped off. Yeah. So our, our song of invitation tonight is going to be song number 363. And uh, once you've marked your song book to song number 363, let's go over to song number 109. Higher grade. <laughs> Oh, 
We'll sing all four verses of this song, but I tell you what, what we'll do is we'll hold the chorus till the end. So we'll sing uh, the four verses and then we'll go to the chorus uh, after the fourth verse of song number 109, 109. I'm pressing on the upward way to rise again every day until praying that exists in order to differentiate inorganic matter from animals and plants. By animals, I am including us humans. We share 